My guest today is Professor Yael Nev, who is Professor of Psychology and Neuroscience at Princeton University. The main focus of our research is to elucidate, elucidate the computational, cognitive, and neural processes involved in learning task representations from experience. Welcome, Yael. Hi. So I want to start with um, one of your recent papers, uh, The Primacy of Behavioral Research for Understanding the Brain. Um, you say understanding the brain requires us to answer both what the brain does and how it does it. Using a series of examples, you say, I make the case that behavior is often more useful than neuroscientific measurements for answering the first question. Um, could you give an example why, why that is the case? Well, what the brain does is create behavior, right? So if we ask, what does the brain do? The brain doesn't make neurons fire. Right, neurons firing make behavior. So if we're asking, what is the brain doing? How is the brain solving different problems? Like if I have to navigate, am I navigating according to landmarks or according to memory of my previous actions? That might sound like a very neural question because memory is, you know, in my brain and my, my vision of landmarks is all uh, neural, but I can much easier, What's going to happen is in our brain, if you look inside your brain, you're going to see both the memory and, and the representation of the landmarks. But it'll be very hard to figure out which one is being used for navigation right now. Whereas you can move some landmarks around and see whether that changes navigation, changes the behavior, and you got your answer. So by manipulating, by doing experimental manipulations and looking at the re at their effect on behavior, we can answer a lot of questions about what the brain is doing and even how the brain is doing them. Like, you know, what is it using as input? What is it using in its algorithm? That would be really hard to answer if by looking into the brain because the brain just is very complex, has a lot of redundancy, represents a lot of stuff that it's not using at any point in time. And so the, the causality there is much harder to figure out. But if we want some sort of a theory of the brain, I don't know if it's possible. Um, behavior has a lot of noise lot of uncertainty, right? Do you think studying behavior will get us to some sort of a theory of the brain? Absolutely. I think the brain has a lot more noise, given that we don't even know exactly what the code is, what area is talking to what, in which way is it, you know, are the, the rhythms, the background rhythms important? Are the glial cells important? I mean, we really, apart from the noise in, in the measurements of the brain, we really don't even know what to look for yet. We have a lot of uncertainty about the brain. Um, behavior is noisy, but the, that noise means, I mean, what does it mean to say behavior is noisy? It means that I can't predict exactly what you will say next, but your brain is creating what you will say next, right? So if I wanna understand what your brain is doing, it's gonna create that sentence, no other sentence. So by measuring, so I, I you know, so. The fact that I can't predict doesn't mean that that's the noise I have to deal with with when understanding your brain, because when I study your brain, I can look at the behavior too. So what I tried to say in that paper is that looking at the brain without looking at behavior, I think, is a really hard way to study to study the brain. By looking at behavior concurrent with, it really helps us so much, which means that we shouldn't be um, frowning on behavioral research because we need to develop very good, very um, precise and incisive scientific, uh, uh, behavioral tasks so that then we can record what's happening in the brain during that task. Um, and so that, and because those tasks tell us a lot about the algorithm that we should be looking for. So basically kind of they give us a really good spotlight under which we can then with our methods that are very specific to sub areas of the brain and to like when you have a very clear question you can ask it in the brain but the exploratory question is really hard at the level of the brain so we need to constrain we need to get really good theory from the behavior so then we can look for the implementation of that theory in the brain and what i yeah. see what i see now in the field is that there is this feeling that if you do behavioral research, you're not contributing to neuroscience. And that's what I was trying to really argue against. I think behavioral, neuros behavioral research contributes a ton to neuroscience. And when we see a lot of very fancy methods used with very 
simplistic behavioral tasks with behavioral tests are not necessarily the optimal ones to ask the question that people are trying to study. It's just a pity, like, you know, go take a, psycho a psychology course, learn more about the behavioral tasks that are out there and, you know, pay people to develop better behavioral tasks or behavioral tasks that ask our questions directly, our neuroscience questions directly, and it'll just accelerate the progress. Yeah, I mean, it, it, this happens to us in many fields, right? Uh, we are very, um, very fond of the reductionist approach uh, to solving uh, complex problems. And, uh, you know, cosmology is another example of this. Uh, neuroscience is an example of this. So uh, engineering way of looking at things, um, you know, goes, goes to sort of taking the machine apart and looking at the nuts and bolts of the machine, trying to understand what the machine does. But I guess what you're saying is that when you reach certain level of complexity, that process may not really allow you to, to understand what is what is happening. Or perhaps what you're saying, you need both, right? You need to sort of look at it holistically from the output perspective and draw that back into the machine somehow and combine that with uh, what the nuts and bolts understanding we have. I mean, let's let's take an analogy of another complex system, which is um, a community of people, right? You wouldn't think that if I want to study um, communities of people and how they interact, I should go and say, well, you know, they all have blood going through their veins and their bones are built in this and that way. Of course, you know, without their bones, they wouldn't be able to stand, so they wouldn't be able to communicate and none of it would have happened. But that's just not the level at which you want to go and understand how this society works. So I kind of think when, when I, I brought this up because you said we want to take the machine apart, but like the brain works in concert in a way that when you take it apart and study each part in isolation, you're missing so much. You just can't do that. It's like, I'm gonna you know, study this society by like examining the hair and teeth and, and face of each person in it. You're not gonna get that far because their interactions is really what you're studying. And I think that's true in the brain too. We're studying interactions between brain areas you know people talk about this area represents x you know this area and this other area represents y and i and i often think the brain is not even in the business of representing things because it doesn't like the things are just it doesn't need to represent it needs to do something with that representation it needs to decide what do i do with the thing that's out there how do i act upon it um and so we might read out representations from different areas, but I don't think that's what those areas are doing. They're not, that's not the end goal of anything. They are changing the information in order to send it to somewhere else differently. But they're not representing stuff as such. And yeah, this is, yeah. you know, funny because I study representation learning, so you would think I would be all wedded to representations. Um, but that's really the kind of representation learning that I study is how do we learn representations that are useful for the next thing? not like that are just a mirror of what's out there. What's out there is already out there. We don't need to mirror it. We need to do something with it. Yeah, the, the community analogy is actually a really interesting one. I always wanted to ask this of a neuroscientist. It, the, the brain is sort of a community of neurons, one could argue. Yeah. And uh, do you think a neuron has sort of a personality? I mean, if, if you if you put a neuron in you know, one position, it's going to behave in one way and put it in another position, it's going to behave in another way. Uh, do, do you think those things could be considered as sort of entities that is has some level of personality in them? You could think of it that way in the sense, I mean, I think, you know, maybe this is anthropomorphizing all kinds of things, because I think... I think countries have personalities. I think you can think of a, of a, of communities as a person. Uh, you can think of it the same way. You could say, you know, a neuron might be more rigid or more flexible, more attuned to input, more prone to changing versus more set in its ways. So you can think about it that way if it's helpful. Um, I don't, you know, I'm not sure that's very helpful for moving our understanding of the brain forward, but you can think of it that way. Yeah, yeah. And, and clearly the historical cycles, um, you know, the, the neurons would have gone through uh, has some effect on how they behave, right, in the future. Mm -hmm. um, and so you say here that I conclude that purely behavioral research is essential uh, for understanding the brain, especially its cognitive functions, contrary to the opinion of prominent funding bodies and some scientific journals. Um, so this is sort of a status quo 
notion um, that neuroscience is more about the brain's hardware and less about what the what the outcome does. Are. What the brain does. Um, I don't know. I think I think there are fads of what's what's in fashion and what's not. And um, you know, journals have to decide what is within the scope and what is outside the scope. And right now, journals like the Journal of Neuroscience, which is you know the Journal of Neuroscience, right? We look to that journal to say this is a flagship society journal. What do you consider neuroscience to be? Um, that journal, maybe that has changed recently. I hope, you know, I hope they will change, um, partly, that's partly why I wrote this. Um, they did not send out for reviews, for review papers that were behavioral only, except in some subfields, if it were motor behavior. So motor behavior is considered, that's okay, because that's what the motor system does. I'm like, you know, that's like I study decision making, what the what decision making does is it makes decisions that are expressed in behavior. Um, so I I just think that they put the 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 they put the boundary in the wrong place. Um, for funding decisions, it's a way bigger deal, I think. And um, I'm actually constantly I'm I'm getting more and more frustrated, not less and less frustrated I, I, by. Um, how I see things moving, the direction that I see them moving. Because for instance, um, the National Institute for, on Mental Health, uh, for mental health is, or, or NIDA, the National Institute for Drug Abuse, funding so many studies. Let's look at National Institute for Drug Abuse, on Drug Abuse. Um, they, you know, drug abuse is a huge problem. People dying, communities ravaged. It's, it's really a huge problem. And it's studied mostly at the level of what is wrong with people's brains. Where actually someone like Hannah Picard, who's a fantastic uh, philosopher who writes about addiction, makes a really, really clear and compelling case. And you should have her on your, on your podcast. Makes a really compelling case that that's not the way to look at it. If this, is, this is more of a question of environment and society and what... So we say, you know, people um, are taking a drug because the drug hijacks their brain. They're not even enjoying it. No, actually, they are enjoying it. It gives them a lot of rewards. It gives them not only enjoyment, but rewards of here's something that I'm good at. I have a community. Uh, it's not like, you know, if I stop taking the drug, immediately a job materializes and a family materializes. And here is everything that I lost because of the drug. A lot of people who take who are um, drug addicts have nothing to lose in the sense that it's not like their life was so rosy before that. So if we're thinking about drug addiction as a problem that we want to um, alleviate, and we only think what's wrong with their brain, their brain, we might never get to the solution. Their brain might, yeah. might be completely fine or you know, doing what brains do, which is to maximize reward. And what we need to do is make the reward come from different sources that are not so uh, dangerous to self and others. And, yes, and it's the same for mental health as well. I, I, really, like you know, how to cure depression, how to cure, um, uh, how to cure anxiety. Is it psychotherapy or is it let's you know do more and more imaging of somebody's brain? A lot of studies, very expensive work. Um, that is, and you know, when you put a lot of money in one study, you're not you're not supporting other studies. It's 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 in the end some zero sum game. Um, looking at resting state, uh, functional connectivity, and not finding anything at huge costs. Whereas we have such rich behavioral that I mean, psychology, um, mental illness is is all it it um, shows itself in behavior. It is all about how people react to things in the world and to the people around them. So to just shut that down and say, let's just look in their brain and see if there is, you know, some neuron that we can fix. I think that's, I, and of course I'm making this very extreme, but to send all the money to finding the neuron that we can fix, my worry is not only that it's not effective, I think we are never going to find that neuron that we can fix. That's not the problem. Yeah, I mean, the irony is that even if we find it, even if you find the area, even if you find the mechanism, 
the chemical interventions of the brain um, haven't been <laughs> haven't been too good. I mean, uh, you know, all the side effects and everything that that comes with it. Absolutely. And so we don't really have a way to counteract, even if we know what what might be mechanistically happening in the brain, right? So, so, so we, like do, say, yeah. we do, but behaviorally, right? So. We, it's very hard to take a drug and target it to a specific circuit, but you can target when I when I teach you something. I am enacting changes in circuits in your brain. When you're practicing a certain type of behavior that you're not used to doing, let's say you have anxiety and so you're avoiding a lot of stuff and you practice that stuff, that changes circuits in your brain. That's actually pretty targeted, right? It's not like something that goes everywhere in your brain and affects your visual system and your cerebellum just like it at, at, at the same time as it affects your frontal cortex. You can target, you can behaviorally and through psychotherapy target uh, ther target change in a much better way. This is kind of demoted, oh, this is not neuroscience because this is not change, targeting the brain. Of course it is. Where, what else is it targeting? It's not targeting the gut, right? It's definitely changing circuits through learning, through experience, through um, talking, through understanding. And I think it's it, 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 that way we can be much more precise. Yeah. Now, having said that, I want to go into one of your papers, which is sort of going to the nuts and bolts of the brain. So the, the human uh, orbitofrontal cortex represents a cognitive map of state space. Um, you say, uh, although the orbitofrontal cortex, OFC, has been studied intensely for decades, its precise functions have remained elusive. Um, you say we recently hypothesized that the OFC contains a cognitive map of task space in which the current state of the task is represented, and this representation is essentially critical for behavior when states are unobservable from sensory input. Um, and so, so the brain is sort of um, game playing here in some sense uh, with, without, um, with, without all the data. We always don't have all the detail. So a year ago, was it a year ago? Maybe two years ago by now, time has lost all meaning with COVID. Uh, <laughs> I taught a seminar called Our, um, Our Subjective Reality because I, I came to, you know, from thinking about the brain at all levels, at the level of perception, all the way to the level of societies and social interactions, we are always making inferences. We always work with a lot of uncertainty and with imperfect information about the world. Um, we have a bunch of senses that help us get converging evidence. You know, I'm looking at your face now. Is that a person? Well, <laughs> you're flat on my monitor, right? Um, so I'm making an inference that there is an actual person there on the other side and in real time we're communicating, but the clues are quite, uh, um, you know, it could be interpreted in, in different ways. I think thinking about our brain as constantly interpreting everything means that we bring in um, prior beliefs. So the interpretation really relies on what we think we're going to see uh, or feel or hear. Um, so that's our memories and our expectations are always coming in. And the specific representations I was talking about in, in the orbitofrontal cortex, um, the idea is when you're performing a task, um, any task, you can think of it as a game, you're playing a game, playing Monopoly or playing Go or playing checkers or chess or whatever, or you can think of it as a task in real life, like you're, I mean, games are in real life too, you're crossing the street, you're ordering in a restaurant, in all of these situations, there's a lot of sensory input, most of it is totally irrelevant for the current task that you're that you're playing, that you're trying to solve, right? You know, you're ordering at a restaurant, it doesn't matter what table you're sitting at, what your waiter is wearing, what, you know, things that matter are, some of them are on your menu, some of them are not. Like, what chef is on on um, uh, holiday now and 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 who is, uh, whose shift is it? Did they get fresh fish today? Like, you don't know these things, but, the quality of your food depends on them. So the representation with which you make the decision doesn't need to have everything that you see. It needs, it should, it can have just a subset of that. 
And it also might want to include things that you don't see. For instance, today is Monday. I know that, you know, you, they say don't order fish on Monday because on Sunday there is no market and whatever. I can't remember exactly how it works, uh, but there's no fish market. on. Um, but they're, usually the, the fish on Monday are not fresh. So you might want to take that into account. So the idea is that the, from our research um, and also based on other people's research that, that we analyzed, um, uh, recordings from rodents from Jeff Schoenbaum's lab and Yuji Takahashi's work. Uh, our hypothesis is that the orbifrontal cortex, um, which is like the very front of your frontal cortex, it's like, you know, for people who are listening to your podcast, um, the more you go up in front in the brain, the more kind of higher level cognition functions there are. And you can think of the orbifrontal cortex as almost the frontal of the frontal cortex. It's like, you know, high, highest level. And so we think that that's where you have the distilled, like this is what's relevant for this task right now. It's a subset of what I perceive and other things that I've added from my memory, from my knowledge, from my expectations, from the fact that I know what day of the week it is, all those things, but kind of a, a distilled, like this is what you need to know to make this decision. And then for my next decision, there will be something else. And that's what we call the state of the task. It's, it's the task is in this state, I'm in a Chinese restaurant and blah, 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 versus um, in, a, in a different, you know, different part of the task. Now that the food has arrived and now I'm, you know, my task is to eat, not to order. The state is completely different. I'm still in a Chinese restaurant, but that's not so important. What's important is I'm using chopsticks and not a fork and a, and a knife. And so if I understand this correctly, um, yeah, so there are two things there. One is sort of the filtration problem. There's a lot of data coming in. You need to focus on what is most important uh, at hand. And the other is, if I understand this correctly, is it's also sort of predicting what is more likely um, so that your actions are appropriate. Is that the way to think about it? I think if I were to divide it into two things, um, and to, oh, I suddenly lost your image. Uh, it will come back. I, I just oh. got a call. <laughs> OK, um, so if I'm thinking about two parts of this problem, I would say the first one, exactly like you said, filtering. The second one, I would say augmenting. So augmenting from memory and from knowledge and from expectation. That's maybe what you're saying about predictions. Um, I think the prediction is given all that, given my filtered representation augmented, now, now I want to predict which action will be best. So that's always a given that given my representation, I want to um, make the best action available. Um, and best doesn't have to be you know, the one that maximizes reward right now. It could be an exploratory action because it has future rewards. I'm, I'm not saying you know, that we're myopic, but we, but we make the, the, that prediction of, of which action is, is best or which action I should do right now based on some representation that has these two sides, the filtering and the augmenting. And I, I just wanted to add that the filtering is really, really important. You might say, well, you know, why bother to filter since we have, you know, a big brain with lots of neurons. We can represent everything that we see right now, including what the waiter is wearing, even though it's not relevant. Um, and, and continue with that and just augment with whatever is missing. But if you think about it, so I, my, my lab and my background is, it, my lab studies learning and my background is in, in thinking about learning of my training. Um, if you think about what you learn from a situation, that also depends on what you represent in the sense of if I represent that my waiter is now wearing a blue shirt and what I ordered today was extremely tasty, do I want to learn that when the waiter wears a blue shirt and I order this, it's extremely tasty? Or do I want to just learn that when I order this, it's extremely tasty? So there is a cost to representing stuff that's irrelevant. There's a cost to not filtering, which is you might be too specific in what you end up learning from the situation. So this area, this uh, OFC, um, it's, it's a pretty small area uh, in the brain. Uh, and if so, no. no, it's not. Pretty big. It's pretty it's big. Pretty it's big. it's yeah. everything above. So above your eyes, kind of inside your, of course, inside your skull. There's a whole kind of layer above your eyes and going a little bit into the into the center and into the sides. So it's it's quite a um, a bit of of cortex real okay. estate. 
And so do we have, um, is there any diseases or something that we know or some data, if you have damage to that area, what happens? Mm -hmm. Definitely. The... So unfortunately, um, damage to the orbitofrontal cortex is not that rare because it happens to be that it's, it's right above a protrusion in our skull. So car accidents where, you know, you have that kind of whiplash where you're your head moves forward very quickly, the orbitofrontal cortex can get smushed by that um, protrusion in the skull. Yeah. So, in fact, there are orbitofrontal patients um, basically have different kinds of, di you know, different amount of lesion in their orbitofrontal cortex, and it's pretty devastating. Um, there's nothing kind of low level that you can't do without your orbitofrontal cortex. So there you can speak, you can read, you can, you know, you remember facts that you knew before, you can make new memories, you can uh, walk, everything, you know, motor is all fine. But what seems to really change is what decisions you make. Hmm. Um, so severe orbitofrontal patients, so with a severe lesion, they really cannot carry out a plan of action. So a, a classic study done um, uh, in London, um, I'm just, having a senior moment and forgetting the name of the researcher who did this. He sent people um, with a list of tasks to do, uh, people who were control subjects or uh, had orbitofrontal lesions. And the idea was, you know, go to the post office and post this letter and then go to the grocery store and buy this and that. And they just could not, could not follow those simple instructions. People can't hold a job unless it's exactly, exactly the same every day and they can somehow get into the groove. They, they Even simple, um, simple decisions become very hard. Mm. Um, big life decisions sometimes change. It depends on, on, um, on exactly the lesion and also emotional responses. So orbitofrontal cortex is very important for emotional responses for um, people with, uh, orbitofrontal lesions sometimes will have a lot of rage and aggressiveness. On the other hand, could be the other way around. So frontal lobotomies, uh, the infamous frontal lobotomies were done basically took out that area of the brain to sedate people. Um, it, it has a really deep effect on us, but you know, we were talking about pulling the machine to a part for all of its parts. Every part is fine. You could do everything. You just can't string them together properly and, and behave with your previous personality in some sense. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting. So it's sort of uh, planning and decision making. The, the brain is, in some sense, we do a lot of this, these things autonomously, right? So, you know, going to the restaurant, uh, ordering a meal or going to a grocery store or something. Much of this is done autonomously. We're not necessarily thinking. Um, I don't know if we are thinking or not, but uh, it becomes sort of a routine in some ways, right? So the brain can almost take over mm -hmm. and, and release the rest of the brain to, to think about something. But <laughs> you're, saying, you're saying it's subconscious. It's not necessarily consciously, you know, we're thinking about it and, and planning and, and, you know, especially when I said, you know, now I'm eating with chopsticks rather than a fork and knife. I don't have to think about it. I can, you know, carry on a conversation, think about math equations if I, if I feel I can doodle them on, on, a, on, a, um, on a napkin while I'm eating with, with the chopsticks, right? So some of it is very um, automatic. Um, so the orbitofrontal cortex actually sends information both to kind of deliberate thinking, to areas in the brain where, that we think are involved in deliberate thinking and to areas of the brain that are involved in habitual actions and automatic actions. Um, it even sends information to very low level areas in the brain. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty magical place <laughs> in the brain, that, that, yeah. that area. Um, and also very strongly connected to the amygdala, uh, which is involved in a lot of emotional processing. Um, and that may be takes us back to why is there, you know, a big difference in decision making if you have an orbitofrontal lesion, but also a difference in emotional reactions. And if, if I'm trying to think theoretically about these, uh, the connection between these two, um, we were talking about situations where you have to infer things and, and you can't, you work under uncertainty, you're making decisions under uncertainty. When you think about it, 
communication interaction with other people is an area of life which one our brain is supremely good at and is basically you know built for that in some sense and we're very social creatures but that's an area with a ton of uncertainty right you never know exactly what other people's intentions are what um you don't even know the, the meaning of what they say right when you talk to me I'm constantly inferring meaning from the words that you are saying. The words don't exactly mean that meaning and they could be uh, they could be ambiguous. And, and so I'm bringing in a lot of expectations. I'm bringing in a lot of prior knowledge. So representing other people's emotions, intentions. Are you now mad at me? Are you going to attack me? Or are you um, cooperative with me? If I have a problem and represent that, I have to infer that. You don't come with a sign. If I if let's say the orbitofrontal cortex is the place that represents that inference for the purpose of decision making if i break that that will explain why i might be very aggressive to you when you're actually coming with a friendly attitude to me because i'm misrepresenting what yeah. what you're going to do and and what your intentions are yeah it's such a complex process so i'm thinking it's also sort of creating options so in in any any context perhaps it's creating set of options because it doesn't quite know exactly what's going to happen. And as new information comes in, you can you know, take the branch that appears to be most dominant um, given that information. So it might be also in the business of, because it's uncertain, everything is looking forward, everything is uncertain. Um, and we're presenting that in a, in a context, right? So it has a lot of different, uh, so when you say a cognitive map of task space, can I think of that as a sort of a the task space a set of options that you might you might uh, consider? Um, you know, we call that paper cognitive map of task task space, and I was actually um, I have regretted that title because I don't think the orbitofrontal cortex is the map. I think it's your location in the map. It's the current state. And so the way I like to think about it now is it's more like, you know, in Google Maps, there's a blue dot of where you are. That's what the orbitofrontal cortex is representing according to our theory and according to the data that we have seen. The whole map itself might be somewhere else or might, I don't know if it's even, you know, so you don't need to represent the whole map the whole time, but the connections, like if I'm here, what is closest to me I'm not sure that the orbitofrontal cortex represents that. I'm not sure it, it doesn't, but my data do not do not say much about that. Yeah. My data can only say that it's representing what where I am right now. So, sorry about that misleading title. We, we no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I want to go to uh, one of uh, another recent paper that you have, a model of mood as integrated advantage. You say mood is an integrate, integrative and diffusive affective state that is thought to exert a per pervasive effect on cognition and behavior. Uh, at the same time, mood itself is thought to fluctuate slowly as a product of feedback from interactions with the environment. So that is, that is intuitive. Um, our decisions are very much affected by our mood. Uh, we could make almost uh, uh, dramatically, diff uh, almost orthogonal decisions <laughs> depending on the mood given a context, right? Um, but but you, you're thinking about here a sort of computational theory uh, of mood. So you want to talk a bit about that? Sure, I'm happy to talk about that. I, I wanted to, um, as you were talking, I thought, you know, I, uh, we should give credit to the people who actually uh, do all this work and and um, and are kind of the the um, the actual parents of these theories that I have the the big fortune of of I, I have the big fortune of working with them. But this is not like all my work at all. The first paper that you talked about, the the one about behavior, that's really you know just me writing my uh, uh, my angst on a piece of paper. Um, but um, the work that we talked about, orbitofrontal cortex, is uh, Bob Wilson and Nico Shuk in my lab both did a lot of that work. Um, Angela uh, Langdon is, is working on that now. Um, and it's based on a lot of animal work from Jeff Schoenbaum's lab. Um, and this mood work was started by Iran Eldar, Dr. Iran Eldar, who is, um, who is at the Hebrew University now and, and was continued. The paper that you're talking about is work by Dan Bennett who is a 
down under in Australia right now, sleeping, I bet, at this hour of the day, uh, this hour of the day here in the US. Um, so what Iran started and, and Dan continued is this idea of thinking about um, why do we have mood, right? We know that mood, that we all feel that we have moods and they affect our actions, but um, why is that at all useful, right? Because we know that, that having a very bad mood for a long time, that's, that's a mental illness, right? That's depression. Um, why do we even need this thing called mood and what does it add to our decision making? How does it influence our decision making? And can we make sense from that what its role is? And the idea is that mood is some sort of expectation that ties th ties together different experiences. It's like a slow average of our experiences. If a lot of good things have happened to me, my mood is better, and that can gloss over some small disappointments and still lead me, you know, lead me in, in the um, path of action that I was taking before and help me predict the future. Um, and opposite when my mood was bad, well, same when my mood was bad, but just, you know, then my, my prediction, my predictions might be that things might not go so well in the future. And so there's an issue here of if, if mood is a summary of my predictions, it should of course affect my behavior. Um, and it can also affect, um, in, in this paper that you just, uh, quoted from Dan's, Dan's work, he's really thinking algorithmically. If we have the why, if we have this kind of um, average, how can it help us in learning to be in learning to behave? And that's another um, learning to make choices and, and make decisions. And that's another kind of justification for why we should have mood. And, and what he was inspired by is the fact that in machine learning, um, in some kinds of problem, it's it's useful to have something called momentum. So if you started learning to a specific direction or changing your behavior to a specific direction, even if um, that doesn't see it, well, even if you get evidence to the contrary, you should maybe continue a little bit in that old direction and not completely abandon what you were doing when you get a little bit of evidence to the contrary, because evidence is noisy all the time. And so averaging averages over noise, you get the, the main gist of things and then all the little bits of noise should not detract you from basically changing to the direction that the average has has uh, sent you to. So it it, um, it increases learning rate. It makes you learn much faster if you have momentum. And so his idea was that um, we can, and he basically developed, it showed that you can write down algorithms of learning behavioral policies in a way that pulls out the role of momentum and that momentum becomes something that um, behaves like mood and has an effect on behavior like mood does. So then the hypothesis is, is that what mood is? It's the momentum from an algorithm of learning how to uh, respond to feedback. Yeah, that's really interesting. So uh, from an evolutionary perspective, um, I'm wondering, this is mood is also sort of transmissible, isn't it? In a in a group, if you are in a good mood, then you can put others in good mood as well. So the the overall outcome for the group could be higher, uh, if that's the case. So this is um, it, it's it's like you say uh, you get a lot of noisy input. If you have some direction, uh, if 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 you change your direction based on you know today's input as opposed to yesterday's input then you won't get anywhere. You'll be sort of wandering around, <laughs> wandering around the, the space, right? So this is sort of constraining you. Is this the way to think about it? Constraining you in the sense that you have a direction that you have been heading, and that is where the momentum part comes in. Even if you get noisy data, mm -hmm. um, you should continue in that direction, right? Is, that is sort of the... Yeah. Uh, yeah, and it's a very interesting observation to think about the social impact there or social influence, which is, which could also confer advantage. I mean, I said before, humans are very social animals, um, presumably because that gives us an advantage, right? And part of the advantage could be, I don't learn everything on my own from my own experience. I can watch other people and mimic 
their actions, for instance, or they can tell me what to do and I can learn from their, from their experience that way. And what you're suggesting is I could also learn from their mood, right? If someone, if everybody around me is in a good mood, you know, I just woke up, I don't know what happened today. Before I go read Twitter, basically, <laughs> everybody's good mood already gives me a good prediction for what is going on and I can adjust my actions accordingly. And especially we can think of that and, you know, maybe it's not a coincidence that bad moods are what affect behavior a lot. I mean, evolution has uh, programmed us to be, um, to be, wary of bad things and you know it's much more important to um to detect the bad things in the environment than the good things because you know the bad things are the ones that can kill you right so i can't think of the analogy of i woke up i woke up and everybody around me is stressed i definitely will not be like okay i'll just go to work as normal I'll be like what's happening oh there's a hurricane warning okay what do we do right so um so again that's a way that we can benefit from social a, a way of social learning, basically. Yeah, I'm thinking, uh, Yale, that, um, yeah, so there's sort of a, one could define a community's mood, like you say. Uh, early on, there could be, you know, 150 people, clans, so there would be clans' mood was very important. So the clan leader, perhaps, um, the, the clan leader who has a higher probability of being in a good mood, um, averaging over time might be considered a good leader, right? So, I mean, we, we have similar sort of things going on in modern context. Uh, people who are optimistic, generally optimistic, tend to be better leaders and so on. So what they are in some sense affecting is the community's mood or the company's mood or the organization's mood that has a net benefit, right? Uh, if the leader is pessimistic all the time, uh, you know, it is truly transmissible. I mean, you, <laughs> you can see if you're around a person who is in bad mood, you know, it affects you quite a bit. You're making me think about, again, the other side, that leaders who invoke fear control people a lot more. So what, what's considered a good leader? Is it the leader that we want or the leader that actually leads us all, you know, could be off a cliff, but literally we follow that person. Um, and what we've seen around us a lot in the last few years, and it's not new, it's always been the case that fear is a way to control people. And so sowing fear, you know, it goes together. It's like sowing fear and saying, and I'm your savior. So follow me because all those things are so scary. Turn up all your fight and flight responses and then do as I say, um, which is kind of cynical manipulation of, of people's tendency to be more affected by negative moods and I mean I'm tying it to mood but actually just to be um, to have much less free choice when they're afraid so we lose we you're talking before about what we think about consciously what we plan and make decisions and what we kind of respond automatically under fear our responses are mostly automatic and so putting people in that state and then saying, here's your automatic response. This is the only thing that you can do. Then people just do that because that's that's really exploiting a trap door in our brain, basically. And you need less data to make decisions um, in that in that state. Essentially, decisions are made for you. Mm -hmm. So you don't necessarily need more data. You don't need, need to analyze. You don't you know need to look for options. The decisions are in some sense made for you. You're actually, uh, you have less capacity. So we know that stress, for instance, reduces the capacity to learn, reduces the capacity to make decisions, reduces working memory, reduces a lot of stuff. So basically you, you are less of a decision-making person, a free choice person when you're stressed and scared. And so you're more manipulatable. Yeah, I, I wondered uh, if this has some uh, applications in uh, machine learning, you know, so momentum is a term used, as you say, in neural networks, um, but in a slightly different, uh, so I wonder if there's another sort of higher order effect that you can import on a, you know, on a deep learning neural network um, that, that could be trained on 
perhaps highly noisy data. You know, the, the, the problem we have is when you, when you have a lot of noise in the data, it get, takes a long time for things to get trained. Uh, where this is some algorithm, I don't know if Dan is working on this or not, but uh, that is more robust in the presence of highly noisy data. Uh, if so, this might be very interesting. I think it's especially robust, uh, more robust in situations where um, the variability, the noise is orthogonal or you know, in a, in a direction that's irrelevant to what you're trying to learn. So if you think about, um, let's say you are, you're walking in a deep ravine and you want to get to the lowest point. So that's optimization. But the noise is like from wall to wall. So it keeps taking wherever you are, the input either says go to the wall on the left or the wall on the right, but you actually need to go to neither of them. You need to go into the, like in the depth of the ravine. Um, that's a situation where momentum really helps because it averages over those fluctuations that are not important about left, right, left, right, when really you should be going, or like, you know, if we think of it, north south when you should be going east um so it's those specific kinds of problems it's not more noise or less noise it's the direction of the noise relative to the direction of the main signal yeah i mean the, the insight also here um if i understand this correctly El, that um it's uh mood is mood is affecting learning mood is not a you know sort of a qualitative cosmetic uh, feeling it's actually something that determines your learning rate. So it's mm -hmm. really fundamental to the brain, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can see that we come from learning and like everything in our, and, and you know, the small world of my lab is connected to learning. Um, you might say we're, you know, we have a hammer, so everything is a nail, but really what we're interested is in understanding learning processes. So we got to move through learning and not, the other way around, really. Yeah, and I always think about, you know, sort of initial conditions. So this is going to prenatal care, you know, early um, early care, um, and it's healthcare, it's education. If you don't have sort of the, let's call it the right mood <laughs> in the environment, uh, you cannot really learn and you you don't have the right initial conditions. And society pays a huge cost for that, right? Um, it, so. I mean, we know this uh, sort of uh, intuitively, but this might put a more of a quantitative framework underneath that, why that might be the case. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so I want to go into another paper, which I have a lot of interest in. I've done some, some related work. Um, so it is the case against economic values in the orbital frontal cortex or anywhere else in the brain, you say. Uh, so, so much of the traditional neuroeconomics proceeds uh, from the hypothesis that values uh, re re reified in the brain. Uh, that is, um, that these are neurons on brain regions whose responses serve uh, the discrete purpose of encoding value. So the hypothesis is supported by the finding that the activity of many neurons co-varies with subjective values estimated in specific tasks, and has led to the idea that the primary function of the orbital frontal cortex is to compute and signal economic value. Um, so this is, yes, yeah, so I, do, I, don't I don't have a lot of insights into how the brain works, but we have a similar problem in businesses in, in terms of making decisions, um, you know, in an R&D program or something like that, when you have a lot of uncertainty and you have sequential decision-making. Uh, so you have a set of sort of interacting options that you have to you have to look at, and each decision you make today is affected by future decisions and so on and so forth. So what happens in complex organizations is that decision makers essentially use gut-based decisions. Um, they don't they don't like the quantitative aspects of how to how to reach decisions, and we can show that gut-based decisions are actually pretty bad. <laughs> oh, they're pretty bad. I thought you would say they're pretty good. In some situations, they're pretty good. Uh, well, I'm, I'm talking the sort of organizational context, you know, when there is a lot of data and there's decisions are quite complex. Um, I mean, if they say, you know, good uh, senior managers get paid a lot of money because they make good decisions, but they can't explain how they make the good decisions. They just say, I make them, right? Uh, and so by trial and error, perhaps they figured out how to, how to make them. Um, but 
you're arguing here that when you make a decision, it's not like you are valuing. You, you, so you have two different things that you could do. You can buy uh, a Ford or a GM, and you're not you're not necessarily valuing the two cars. Uh, you're just sort of going by your intuition and your gut feel. Is that what you're arguing? No, not necessarily. Um... Most of our decisions are not between a Ford and a GM car. <laughs> Most of our decisions are between things that are very different from each other. Like um, right when I finish talking to you, do I go and read the emails that I uh, that I've gotten in the last hour, or do I first go home? Like these are things of different types. And the one of the ideas that comes from a, a very um, kind of prominent idea in thinking about decision making, and this comes from um, economics, is, well, how can we compare apples and oranges? How can I compare reading my emails to going home to my kids? Um, I have to put them in some common currency. How, what is the value for me of reading these emails? What is the value for me of seeing my kids? And then I can just compare those two numbers and say, which is highest? And that's what I choose. If I think about, you know, Introspection is not the best way to do science in any sense, but it gives us ideas. It doesn't feel like that's what I decide, right? Um, I have no idea what the value of reading emails. Like, who even knows? Um, so a lot of, so what we are saying, uh, what I'm saying in that paper together with Ben Hayden uh, from uh, University of Minnesota is that there isn't a lot of neural evidence either or even behavioral evidence to this fact that, to this very prominent idea that we first calculate values and then base decisions on that. What's, there are many other algorithms for decision-making and for learning that don't depend on that. That for instance, will they're still learning, they're not you know, gut feeling that is senseless. They're very sensible uh, uh, algorithms. But for instance, an algorithm that says, um, when I, I learn policies, I learn behavioral policies, not by valuing it, but by doing something, seeing that that turned out well. So, you know, I went home before reading my email and my kid said, oh, mommy, it's so great to have you home early. Let's play a game. That will just increase my tendency in the future to go home early. But I didn't have to go through a value. I went through, I did something. It turned out well, so I do more of it. So these are called policy learning um, methods where you learn a behavioral policy and you don't have to go through, well, so was that 5.9 or 6.2? Like, who cares? So that's what, that's what we're arguing. We're arguing that the brain learns, the brain is smart, all of that. It just doesn't have to com compute values on the way because that's really hard and maybe not necessary in most cases. Yeah, I have said that from an economic value perspective. So, uh, you know, I think of this as sort of a risk management problem. So it's, let me let me ask you this. I, I don't have a lot of insights into this. So suppose I frame it in such a way that what the brain is doing is really risk management. It's not really trying to maximize value. It's trying to minimize risk. And your risks are have high higher moments, you know, it's very skewed and high kurtosis and all of that. So essentially you are you're trying to minimize risk. Whether you're going to go read those emails or go home, it's sort of a risk question. If you miss a you know an important email that has some mm -hmm. very, very um asymmetric um uh, aggregate risk for you, right? So I wonder if that is what the brain is doing. So it's not really, you know, trying to figure out what the value is, but basically, well, fundamentally, from an evolutionary perspective, one would think that that is what we are trained for. When I mean, we we are trained to survive, basically, that that was that was for hundred thousand years that that was there, <laughs> that was all there, right? Just so that's to survive. A really, that's a really interesting way of saying it and asking really what is the brain maximizing, right? So economists will say, well. You can put a number on risk too. You can quantify. You can take the av You know, you can. You can. Uh, no matter that it's skewed and stuff, you can calculate the expected risk and subtract that from the expected gain. And you can summarize everything in the end as a number. And it's true, you can. But do you have to? That's really what we're asking. And does the brain do that? The fact that you can, in the end, summarize everything as a number doesn't mean that that's what the brain does. 
And so what we're arguing in that paper is that there's been this automatic assumption that the brain does this, but if you put that assumption to test, I don't know that there's a lot of evidence to suggest that that assumption is true. And it doesn't mean that the brain doesn't, you know, do sensible things. It just might not put them in the form of a number. And, and there's yeah. a lot of research asking what area in the brain represents that number. And we're like, well, maybe none, because it's just not there. Yeah, I, I, know, I don't know if it's a number or it's a probability distribution. It's a picture. So for instance, I could, I could envision there are two pictures the brain could make, sort of a risk distribution picture. Mm -hmm. And it can look at distribution X and distribution Y, and then say, yeah, I prefer X to Y. Um, that it could be based on experience, it could be based on you know, a variety of things, right? So, so I don't think it uh, sort of reduces it to a number, but it might still reduce it to some construct that we haven't really found yet. Um, look, the brain makes complex decisions, mostly correctly, but with a lot of quirks. And I think those quirks are places where rather than saying, oh my God, how are people not rational? The rational assumption comes from, you know, if we did, if we were presented these distributions correctly and made decisions based on that, you could say, you know, the rational thing would be X, Y, Z. And then you find that people are do X, Y, but not Z. So maybe that says that that's not what they're calculating. And so there's been a lot of there's a lot of uh, uh, there are a lot of anomalies in people's decision making that that also go against calculating maximizing value. Um, you can ask the same about minimizing risk, and you know the the value of a theory. You know, you just articulated a theory, a hypothesis, is you go and make predictions from it and test that. And again, this takes us to the very beginning of today. I think you could test it really well in behavioral experiments. You don't even have to stick an electrode in the brain, but you have to think really carefully about what are the predictions and what is the situation in which your theory makes a specific prediction. And then you can ask, do people behave that way? And if they do, right, you have supported your theory. All uh, right, maybe we can, uh, we can collaborate on something. Uh, <laughs> it's an area of great interest to me because it has a lot of applications, uh, not from an individual decision-making perspective, but also organizational decision-making perspective, right? And so understanding how the brain makes decisions, the other complication here obviously is regime dependent, right? How I make decisions today is going to be quite different, uh, potentially quite different tomorrow if something, you know, something happened. And so- well, yeah, If you think context depend, you know, how you make decisions at work is different from how you make decisions at home. I mean, we can even think about like, most of us are different people at work and at home, like really different people. The way I speak to my kids, I would not speak to people at work. Um, it just my emotional reactions are not the same. I, my just a different person. So you can think of that as decision making that's very context dependent. Yeah, there, there could be an experiment. Uh, uh, yeah, so they say that domesticated animals brains have shrunk because they have no challenge anymore. You know, they get their food and they're just lying around for humans to enjoy. Um, I suspect they, their sort of risk minimization processes have, have declined substantially. So it would be interesting to look at, you know, sort of somebody in the wild, an animal in the wild, how does that animal make decision given the same inputs uh, as opposed to a domesticated animal? And I wonder if we see some differences there. Yeah, it's very interesting. A lot of the animals that we study are basically, you know, lab rats and mice. They also get all their food in the lab. Not only that, they have very impoverished environments in which they are raised. Sometimes they don't have social peers with them. Um, those are the brains that we study most of the time. What do they even, are they even, you know, are they even the same as wild animal brains? Um, and people who study rodents in the wild, for instance, Hopi Hoekstra at, um, at uh, um, Harvard, I believe she's at Harvard, um, really interesting, really interesting to see how the behavioral repertoires and the decision-making of wild animals are um, very, very rich. I think richer than what we see in the lab.
So, so in conclusion, you know, um, you're doing a lot of work in both 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 areas, both sides of this coin, uh, both on the psychology behavior side as well as neuroscience side. Um, what is your sense? Are we making progress uh, towards some sort of a theory of the brain? Um, uh, or if you're not, uh, if you look forward 5, 10, 15 years, where do you think we will be? Will we get a better understanding? Well, if I looked at forward 5, 10, 15 years, I first hope that we will be doing a lot better on, on our emissions and, and, and climate change. That's much more important, honestly. Um, but I also hope that that we'll have a better understanding or kind of a more clear-eyed view of how we can um, how we can um, target treatment to, for instance, so I'm working a lot now in the in the field of computational psychiatry and computational psychotherapy. So targeting treatments for mental health issues for addiction uh, as well, um, according to the needs of different people. I hope that in 5, 10, 15 years, we will be somewhere else there. And, you know, that depends on understanding the brain, but not necessarily understanding the neurons in the brain, understanding how the brain interacts with the world. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm... Uh, who who can predict five, ten, or fifteen years? I mean, honestly, fifteen years ago there was barely any internet. Um, maybe not fifteen years ago, but like twenty years ago there was, you know, barely any internet. I remember the days when uh, when you know we did not have email, and when I had like a joint email account with my boyfriend that I think now is like what? Um, so fifteen years is a long time. I have no idea. I feel that I have learned over the years more. I feel like I, I personally, I remember as an undergrad thinking, oh, I'll learn everything they know about the brain and then continue from there. And very early on, I was like, oh my God, they know almost nothing about the brain. So I now, after all these years, feel like I have a better idea of what the brain is doing. Um, I think that as a field, we have a lot better ideas of what the brain is doing. And as a, when I say as a field, I'm not saying necessarily neuroscience separate from psychology or psychology separate from neuroscience. I think the combination is very powerful. And so I'm sure in 15 years, we'll know a lot more. Um, I hope we'll, you know, I hope other things don't overpower that with, um, you know, catastrophes. Yeah, I just thought of something that, that is actually quite close to what you're saying. So I did some work a few years ago in behavioral health. So we used EMR data, electronic medical records of behavioral health, therapists and patients. And what we demonstrated is that we can, using algorithms, match a patient to a therapist, optimally match a patient to a therapist. And if we do that systematically, we can show the outcomes are a lot better. So the length of stay and the and the cost of an episode can be substantially reduced. And so, so we are not still, I mean, we have techniques now, um, you know, the, the, in these areas, but we are not really deploying them in a way that is on the behavior side that could have a, a real effect on patients. I think that is what you were talking about before, right? Yeah, it takes a long time actually to deploy techniques like that. It takes about 15 years. So like if you have a great idea right now, it might be in, in wide use in 10 or 15 years. Um, things change slowly that, you know, momentum, right? There's good and bad in changing slowly. You don't want to, you know, it's slow. On the other hand, you don't want to drive people crazy and every day say, no, no, no there's a new therapy. You no, know, stop that old therapy. Now there's something else. Now we move you to a different therapist. Now we... So, you know, it is what it is. There's a lot of momentum out there and uh, it takes a while to put in something new. Yeah, yeah I'm thinking on the mood side, this four year election cycles that we have sort of destroys the mood for the entire country, right? <laughs> you almost have to start over every four years, which is a, which is a very problematic concept. Well, one of the things that I've learned from the four years before is that actually we shouldn't, we, sh we shouldn't stop. Like what I learned about my role in society um, in the Trump presidency 
is that I, I most of the problems are local. Most of them do not end when a president, do not change even, do not budge at all when a president changes. So the problems that I opened my eyes to then, they still exist. I'm still an activist. I still do the work. You still need to go out and demonstrate. You still need to volunteer, still need to do ev everything and also vote, but not only vote. So I think that um, that's a fallacy that hopefully, um, yeah, the president is powerful, but not that powerful, actually. That's good. Yeah, excellent. This has been great, Yael. Uh, thanks so much for spending time with me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.